is evil proof that there is no God. He did a great job explaining that the very recognition of concepts like good and evil demand an explanation. And I love how he went to that quote from C.S. Lewis. How can we even know if a line is crooked if we don't have some idea of what a straight line is? The very fact that we talk about good and evil, the very fact that those questions get asked, draw us to the reality that there is a God. There were some other great thought-provoking questions that he brought up in that video as well. For instance, where do we get our sense of morality? What is good? What causes somebody to stop being good? And I use that term very relatively. How are we sure what evil truly is? Can I tell you this morning, I am so glad that you showed up at church today with those questions burning inside of you. Some of you didn't even sleep last night. You were up because you couldn't wait to get here to figure out how those questions were going to be answered. Okay, I know I'm saying that a bit facetiously, but I do want you to understand that whether or not those were the thoughts that were on the top of your mind when you woke up today and as you were singing, they probably weren't. How many of you have been asked questions like that at some point in your life by somebody else if you've not asked them yourself? Here's the reality. I want you to understand right off the bat before we jump into anything, we must pay attention. Truth matters. Getting our facts straight. If, we're gonna in, if we are going to engage our world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we better be know how to answer Questions like this that are asked every day, all the time, all around the world. And the second you start getting into conversations about God, they quickly go to, how can God be good if there's all this evil that's in this world? Well, can I tell you this morning that Romans chapter 1, the passage of Scripture that we just read, answers all those questions in a beautiful way. It fills in the blanks. This morning, we're going to see why we have an idea of that straight line that he was talking about. What is just and unjust? This morning, we're going to see what causes somebody to stop being good. What evil truly is and God's solution for evil. There's a lot of important things that we're going to be talking about this morning. So I hope you will sit on the edge of your seat. And I say that with all sincerity. I hope that you'll get a pen and paper out or get something that you can take some notes and jot some things down because this passage gives us answers that we need, some facts that we have to have straight. And that leads me to the title of my message this morning, which is this, Wrath 101. Last week we talked about the Gospel 101. Well, today we're going to be talking about some very basic elements about the wrath of God that we all need to clearly understand. Have you ever needed something, but didn't realize how much you needed it? How about sleep, for instance? Now, I know I see a lot of wise people in here, but do you remember those days a long time ago where you thought that sleep was overrated? And it didn't matter how much your parents or wise people in your life told you about the importance of sleep you could just say, no, I don't need sleep. I can handle it. I can handle whatever comes my way, right? You remember those days? Now you're old and you're wise and it doesn't matter what's going on. You just lay down on the floor and go to sleep because you realize how important it is, right? How about a healthy diet? How about a, Anybody else have teenage boys? I got three teenage boys in my house. Can I tell you? Actually, I need you to help me. I need, I need all of you wise people to, to help my boys see some wisdom. Does anybody think that a a consistent diet of chips and fast food and french fries and ramen noodles, although we will keep ramen noodles because they are cheap. Praise God for cheap snacks, all right? Ramen noodles can stay. And then the most recent one, Stuart walked in the house the other night. It's like 10 o'clock at night. We're watching TV, and he walks in the house with a gallon of high C, just drinking it right out of the thing. And I'm like, where did this come from? I mean, High C by the gallons. I mean, his mom's like, do you know how much sugar is in that? Does anybody think that that will catch up with them at some point or another in life? Raise your hand so they can all see. Okay, yes, there it is. Hands everywhere, boys. All right. Oh, you know what motivates me in some of these basic areas that we know about? You know what motivates me? The consequences. I don't like how I feel when I don't get a good night of sleep. My wife does not like how I act when I don't get a good night of sleep. The wrath of my wife motivates me to go to, no, I'm just kidding. But listen, the consequences, you understand? Hey, I don't like how I feel after CCs. 
Man, when I was in college, I used to go to CC's. I can't tell you how much I ate, but I had to go back to my room, lay on my bed, sick to my stomach for like two hours. The wrath of that has caught up with me. I never want to step foot into CC's again in my life. Anybody can say a big amen to that. If you got teenagers, where do they want to go? Hey, by the way, it's cheap too. Just take them there. Just give in. They'll learn one day. You have to experience some things. No, the consequences. I want you to look at, at verse 18 this morning. It says, for the, what's that next word right there? For the, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. You know what wrath is? Wrath is God's deeply personal hatred and abhorrence of evil and his actions against it. Let me just say that one more time so we're all clear this morning. Wrath is God's deeply personal hatred and abhorrence of evil and his actions against it. The wrath of God has been revealed in this world. By the way, his wrath, we need God. His wrath is designed to draw us to our desperate need of God. The wrath of God being revealed is part of his solution for evil but also for salvation. And this morning, my prayer as we go through this passage is that the wrath of God would drive you to Him, not out of some sort of sense of fear and terror that if you step out of the line, God's going to send His lightning bolts out of heaven and zap you up, but know that the wrath of God would cause us to want to run and hide in Him and find refuge in Him because He is our safety and He is our hiding place. And in a world that is filled with evil, where the wrath of God has been revealed, it's there to draw us to Him because He is the safest place that we can be in all of the world. So this morning, we're going to be talking about God's wrath. So let's just jump right into it. Number one, I want you to see this morning. God's wrath is righteous. God's wrath is righteous. One of Paul's big goals in the book of Romans is to prove the righteousness of God. That's one thing you're going to learn as we go throughout this entire book. Many believe that verse 17 is actually the theme verse for the entire book. So we'll go backwards here just a little bit. Go ahead and put verse 17 up on the screen. The Bible says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Paul's goal is to use the gospel, to use the book of Romans, to prove that God is just and God is right in all of his actions towards mankind. Do you believe this morning that God is just and that he is right? Amen. Well, this matters because what follows in verse 18 Right after he says that the righteousness of God has been revealed, he says that the wrath of God has been revealed. Before we go any further with this message, I want you to understand this morning that not only do we have to firmly be convinced in our minds that everything that God does is just and right, we also have to be firmly convinced that everything that God's word says is true and right, and that if God's word says it, then I need to believe it, and I need to to sink my teeth into the truth, and I need to understand it, and I need to live it out in my life every day. What we're going to be talking about today is not Mike Brown's words or not my opinions. You don't need those. You don't need my opinions. You need God's word. That's what we desperately need more than anything else. So we've got to accept it because God is good and right in all that he does. We're talking about God's wrath is righteous. Well, can I tell you that God's wrath makes sense? God's wrath makes perfect sense. Verses 16 through 20 is one argument of sustained logic, okay? One argument of sustained logic. All right, I've already asked you a couple times to, to sit on the edge of your seats today. I know you guys are so excited because you came to church today, and you're going to get a little bit of an English grammar lesson. How many of you love grammar? Wow, that is weird. Did not expect that many people to raise their hand to that. All right, as we go through... Verses 16 through 20. Um, by the way, I, I'm, sometimes I'm not that good in grammar. Elena, what was that word I said last week? S spectacular. I said specificer last week. 
specificer in church. She, she called me out on it. I get grammar lessons at home at lunch. I was trying to remember that word, but you might hear me say weird things, okay? Just call me out on it. It's okay. I will listen. I will try to make sure I correct it. But anyway, as we go through verses 16 through 20 here in a minute, you will notice the word for, okay? The word for, F-O-R. Does anybody know in English grammar we call the, the word for is known as a what? A conjunction. How many of you knew that? Okay, and what do conjunctions do? Conjunctions connect clauses or sentences. They connect thoughts, separate thoughts with each other, okay? So as we go through verses 16 through 20, you're going to find the word for showing up over and over again because he's connecting one thought with the next thought with the next thought because what you have is one argument of sustained logic, all right? So are you ready to go through and see what this is? Look at verse 16. All right, so Paul, I'll just remind you, last week he set it up. He told the Romans, I cannot wait to get to Rome. I want to preach the gospel. There are people that are lost. I want to get to Rome to preach the gospel. And then he says in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of God. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And then why? Why is he not ashamed of it? Okay, so here's your first thought to the next. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So Paul's excited to preach. He's not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Well, how is it God's power? How do we see that? Look at verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Okay, so the gospel is the power of God to salvation. How? Well, in salvation, in the gospel, you see the righteousness of God. You see that God is good and right in declaring sinners righteous before him because he still executed the death penalty. The penalty for sin was death, and on the cross, his son Jesus died. And so sin was paid for, and when he forgives sinners, and when he declares us to be righteous before him, it proves that God is good and just and righteous, and he does not let sin get by. And you know what else is true? The righteousness of God is revealed in us as we live by faith in the righteousness of Jesus. His righteousness begins to be seen as we transform into his likeness. Okay, so are you following along? So he's not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. How? The righteousness of God is revealed. Well, why is it necessary that the righteousness of God be revealed? Because of verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed. From heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. It's important that we understand that God is right because at the same time that he is good and righteous, his wrath is also being revealed. Well, why is the wrath of God being revealed? Look at verses 19 and 20. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You understand what he just said? That the invisible things of God, they are seen. God himself has been revealed. His eternal power and Godhead, his glory, it is seen in creation. You can see God everywhere. He, is, he has put himself on full display. And instead of man embracing the truth of God, we hold the truth in unrighteousness. We suppress it. So if you want this to make even more sense, all we can do is go backwards right now real quick. Because God has revealed his glory in an undeniable way so that man is without excuse and man rejected God, the wrath of God has been revealed. And at the same time that the wrath of God has been revealed, the righteousness of God was being revealed. And how do we see the righteousness of God? In the power of the gospel that is able to save sinners. Can I get an amen to that this morning? Wow. Wow. It's so important to understand that God's wrath is righteous because we're about to just lay out and expose how wicked and evil mankind really truly is. God's wrath makes sense. God's wrath is being revealed. It's revealed in our world today. It's visible. You can see it. It's not in the way that you would think. God's wrath is not being revealed in some huge, dramatic way um, in the way that we would think, okay? It's not like that. He's not 
at work by intervening in a huge dramatic way, but by him not intervening. Okay, look at verse 24. I got to show you this before we move on because this, this sets up everything else where we're going. Everybody read that, that first, those first uh, five or six words of this verse with me out loud, okay? Everybody up on the screen, what's it say? Wherefore God also gave them up. It says right there, we are going to find three times as we go through the rest of this passage, three times, this phrase or a phrase that is very similar. You know how God's wrath is being revealed? You know how it's at work in our world today? Quietly. God's wrath is at work quietly by leaving sinners alone in their sinful ways and allowing the consequences that come as a result. That's how God's wrath is being revealed. He lets us alone. I've told you before, one of the scariest verses in all of the Bible to me is Psalm 106, where it says, he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their souls. God is eventually going to allow you to have exactly what you want. He's going to give you up to it. And when you do, when that happens, his wrath is going to be revealed in the consequences that come with us choosing our way over God's way. And here's the practical application that we need before we go any further. I need God. God's wrath is righteous, and I need God. Nothing keeps people away from Christ more than their inability to see their need of Christ or their unwillingness to admit their need of Christ. All right, how many of you, is anybody in here married to a husband? Okay, it could be a wife, more than likely a husband, though. Anybody married in here to a very stubborn husband, who will rather live in pain, okay, for days, weeks, months even, instead of just admitting that maybe he should go to the doctor and get some help. Is there anybody here that's like that? You're saying you're married to a man like that? Yeah, okay, I see some hands going up. I was reading last night. Do you know that this is a real thing? It, it is a real thing. People will avoid things that they don't want to be real. Let me just say this one more time. People will avoid things that they don't want to be real. For instance, sometimes a lump shows up or a cough that won't go away or shortness of breath. All you got to do is Google. You'll see this all over the place. They will avoid it because they don't want to deal with something that might end up being real. And so we convince ourselves that it's just going to go away and that it's just going to take care of itself when in all actuality it is there to show us that we are in desperate need of help with something that is outside of ourselves. Can I beg of you this morning, don't avoid God's wrath. Don't avoid God's wrath. You know those consequences? They are good and right. His wrath is the pain that is in our lives that is showing us that what we're doing is wrong, that what we're doing is destructive, that what we are doing is leading us away from God. And it's there to show us that we need help. We need someone greater and bigger than ourselves. We need God. That's why his wrath has been revealed, to draw us to the safety that we can find in him. God's wrath is righteous. Secondly, I want you to see this morning that God's wrath is deserved. God's wrath is deserved. Look at verse 21. It says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. These verses that we're going to look at here right off the bat, they, they, they kind of explain one of those questions that Ben brought up in the introduction, like, how does a person stop being good? And I, I use that word good relatively because we know that there is none good but God. But in these verses, in verse 21, for instance, you know what you see? You see the de-evolution of man. Everything about God is contrary to what is the wisdom of man. Our world, what does our world do? Our world teaches evolution. What is evolution? It is the teaching, that the gra it's the teaching of the gradual development of something, especially from something simple to complex. But you know what this verse teaches us? The de-evolution of man. We started high. We started with a knowledge of God. But we suppressed the truth of who God is. And we turned it into a lie. And as a result of that, their foolish heart was darkened. Man started high and ends up low. Whenever you reject God, you are going to go the opposite direction. You're not going towards God. You're going away from God. Instead of being thankful for all that God created and all that God gave us and the talents and the abilities and all the things that we have to enjoy in this world. Do you know what Adam and Eve did in the garden? 
They believe the lie of Satan. Yea, hath God said? And they doubted God's goodness. And they doubted God's wisdom. And they rejected the truth of who God was. And as a result, we fell into sin. And we do the same thing all the time in our lives. For some reason, we think that we know what's better for us than what God says is good for us. And we reject and we doubt his goodness and his wisdom. And we run away from him. And when we do that, our foolish hearts become darkened. Now, look what it says in verse 22. He builds on this. Professing professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Man's wisdom only reveals his foolishness. I was thinking about, well, look at verse um, 23. Look how. It says, And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. I think that idolatry is one of the strangest, most unreasonable things in all of this world. (laughs) But yet you see idolatry everywhere. I was thinking of um, the Greek gods, for instance. You want to talk about the foolishness of man. I was thinking about the Greek gods. Anybody have an interest in the Greek gods? It seems like they kind of make a resurgence. They're in a lot of movies and different things like that. But let's start with Zeus, for instance. Zeus, he is the father of gods and humans. But guess what? He was not always faithful to his wife. And in fact, Zeus can um, transform himself into anything that he thinks and anything that he wants so that he can go mix and mingle with the other gods and goddesses of the world. That is in complete contrast to the God of the Bible who says, I am God alone and I change not. All right, then you can go from Zeus, you can go to um, Poseidon. Poseidon is the god of the sea. He's the earth shaker, all right? Sailors, they would pray, they would beg the god of Poseidon for his mercy, that he would spare them of their anger. Poseidon was an angry god. I mean, he could take his trident, he could plunge it into the sea, and he could shake that sea from end to end, and before sailors would go and sail, they would beg the god of Poseidon to be merciful to them and to not pour out his anger on them. When we're talking about the wrath of God, he doesn't want us to approach him in that type of a way. Oh, God, just help me to do right today. Spare me from your your indignant wrath, the the whims of your personality. If something hits you the wrong way today, it might just make you angry. Spare me from that. That's not our God. I think of Aphrodite. Aphrodite, she's the goddess of beauty and passion. You know what Aphrodite can do? Aphrodite can inspire love in the hearts of men and women. How many of you like love? Okay, don't admit it if you do. Okay, no, just kidding. Love is a wonderful thing. Love is a good thing. She can inspire love in the hearts of men and women, but she herself was stuck in a loveless marriage. She was a vengeful woman. She had multiple affairs and children outside of their affairs. I I kid you not, this is like the stories about their gods that they worship who are bigger than themselves. All they do is make gods that look exactly like us, and what kind of a god is that? We need someone bigger and greater than ourselves. And you might sit here and say, okay, Pastor Mike, I mean, you are talking about simple stuff. Like, we're not, no one here is worshiping the Greek gods. I hope not anyway. I hope no one here is bowing down to any idols or statues. You might be wondering, what does this have to do? But yes, that may be true. But all the time, we take the glory of God and we exchange it. We exchange it for everything that we we put more importance on than God. We exchange it for our careers. How many people have invested all of their time and energy and their blood, sweat, and tears into building a career only to see everything else crumble from their lives? Man, we do it. We put sports over it. There's people that that take their kids out of church on Sunday to go to travel ball. For what? For maybe the one, I mean, the the less than 1% that can make it to the next level. I mean, what are we teaching and what are we showing when we take the uncorruptible great God and creator of the universe and we exchange his glory for something that makes sense to us? We do it not because we don't know God. We do it because we think we know better than God. Look at the result. Verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. How is the wrath of God revealed? Self-deification. When we put ourself above God, self-deification quickly leads to self-indulgence in just one short step. And you know what we see all over our culture today? Sexual immorality. 
And can I tell you, out of a heart of love and concern, sexual immorality kills. It destroys. The Bible tells us that when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. Sexual immorality destroys marriages. Sexual immorality destroys homes and relationships with children. Sexual immorality creates diseases in this world today. Sexual immorality will destroy your purity. And don't ever underestimate your purity. If you are young and single and you are pure, value that. That is a wonderful gift from God because the second you give it away, you can never get it back. And when you go into a sexual relationship that is outside the bounds of how God created it to be inside of marriage, I promise you this, it complicates everything. I know a young couple uh, that, that I counseled with that had um, a sexual relationship before they got married, and they got married, and they only ever had that relationship with each other. But after their marriage, she started wondering if the only reason why he married her was because they had a sexual relationship and he was stuck. And can I tell you, when you lose that purity, it will show up and it will affect you in all kinds of ways. That's what God does. He gives us up to our desires and he lets us have what we want. Let's look at the next one. Not only do we see that God's wrath is deserved for willful ignorance, but secondly, we see that God's wrath is deserved for harmful indulgence. Look at verse 25. And by the way, bear with me. We're going to we're gonna get to the gospel, okay, and the hope that comes. But look at verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Everybody say amen out loud together. Amen. Since it's impossible to get rid of God, okay, man has taken the truth of God that is perfectly revealed, and God has created all of us with a God-sized hole in our hearts that only he can fill. Every human being, every human being has a knowledge of God. And when we suppress that truth and hold it in unrighteousness, it becomes painfully clear and painfully ev evident that God's not going anywhere. So what we have to do is we have to take the truth about God, and now we have to convert it and change it into a lie. And that's exactly what happens. So that we can live as if we succeeded in getting rid of God. It's never going to happen. Well, look at, look at the results. Look at verses 26 and 27. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their heir which was meet. Make no mistake about it. Those verses are talking about homosexuality. Before I go any further, I want you to understand, and I, I hope you will see and understand my heart, what I'm about to say is not hate speech. Our world wants us to believe that it's hate speech. No, it is the truth of God's word. I want you to understand very loud and clear, I do not hate or despise any single homosexual that's in this world. I have them in my own family, in my extended family. I have people that I love and care for deeply that have fallen into this. But just because that, that may be true and just because our world wants us to believe something, we have to take the truth of God's word and we've got to sink our teeth into it. And there's a couple things that this passage clearly teaches. One of them is this. Homosexuality is against nature. It says that. It is against nature. To act against nature is to violate God's created order. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. You will see that everything was good except for man. It was not good that he should dwell alone. And so God puts Adam to sleep, and he takes a rib out of his side, and he creates woman, which means out of man. And inside of, and, and then God brings Eve to Adam in the garden, and he says, you shall leave father and mother and cleave unto your wife, and the two of you shall be one flesh. And then you know what Jesus does? And, and part of the one flesh is for recreation, for procreation. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That's not happening between a woman and a woman and a man and a man. And then you get to the New Testament and Jesus shows up on the scene and he reiterates the very truth that was established way back at the beginning. And so to go against nature is to violate God's very clearly created order. 
The natural result of suppressing the knowledge of God and turning the truth of God into a lie is to end up in an unnatural place, which is unseemly and vile. That's what the Bible says. It's shameful. You know what else homosexuality is? Homosexuality is the display of false worship. You, you, I, I sometimes would think that when we come across idolatry in the Bible, that idolatry only has to do with the Old Testament. You see it all over the Old Testament, you know, but like in America, there's not a lot of idols and idol worship and things like that. But can I tell you that you will see how it says in the Bible that they worship and serve the creation more than the creator? You see that so clearly in the homosexual movement, gay pride marches, pride month, big money corporate sponsors, how much big money is in solidarity with the whole LGBTQ agenda in our world today? Then you got cancel culture. All of that gives us a modern day picture of what worshiping the cre creature looks like. And the reason why I bring this up, it's here in this passage. It's clear. Again, they worship and serve the creation more than the creator. And I have to remind our church and I have to remind ourselves, we must not, we cannot bow to that idol. And the pressure is becoming more and more, and it's becoming relentless. And they're trying to back us as Christians into a corner saying, if you even bring stuff like this up, it's hate speech. And how could you be so hateful and harmful in your words? No, this is the truth of God's word, and we must not bow as God's people. Amen. Homosexuality is God's judgment. At the end of verse 27, it says, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their heir, which was meat. There is nothing innocent or morally neutral about the homosexual agenda. I remember being back in the 1990s where it was talked about on a regular basis and people back then would warn that, man, if you open up the door here, you're going to start opening up the door to all kinds of things. And we are seeing that lived out right in front of us in our world today because look at what is happening to our children. Children are being diagnosed with ROGD, rapid onset gender dysphoria. A young boy can believe that he should have been a, young, a, a girl, and a young girl can believe that she should have been a young boy, and the adults and doctors and scientists in their lives can tell them that their only hope, and I, I know there's kids in here, but you talk about this at home, I need to say it because it's the truth, their only hope is genital mutilation. Can I tell you, that is pure insanity. They want to back us into a corner and tell us to follow the science. I'll look them right in the face and say, exactly, follow the science. I mean, you're seeing Romans 1 lived out in, si in front of us. Their foolish hearts were darkened. The wise are, are giving over. The, 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 the wisdom of the world is foolishness. I mean, just think about it. How, how can we be told with bold confidence on one hand that science, science proves that people are born gay, transgender, bisexual, lesbian. I mean, people are born that way. It's proven scientifically. But on the flip side of that, we can just totally disregard our sexual biology, our very maleness and our very femaleness, and it can be changed at the whim of a surgeon's knife. That's hogwash. That is a lie. How can we, how can we fall for that? I mean, it's common sense that's being lived out right in front of us. It's Romans 1. That's the foolish heart. God gives us up, working in themselves, that which is unseemly. And right now, the state of California, counties are having to pass rules that if a child comes and talks about what they believe their sexual orientation is, that they actually have to tell parents because they're trying to pass laws where they keep it from their moms and dads. Again, it's pure insanity. When you act against God's created order, you are doing irreparable harm against your own body. And that leads me to the last part of this, which is depraved minds. Look at verse 28. It says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Man, I say this not with anger, too, because, again, I, I just want to go back and just reiterate this. What the world does not need is a bunch of Christians getting just pure, flat-out angry and screaming and yelling, you know, it's an abomination of God. Yes, we do need to speak the truth, but we need to do it in love. These are people that are lost and broken and need the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
who says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. I'm just going to read through verses 29 through 30 and 31 and let them speak for themselves. I mean, where does evil come from? What is evil? Remember those questions from the beginning? This, it comes from knowing God, suppressing God, taking the truth of God, turning it into a lie. Then God gives us over to depraved minds, and this is the end result. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, gossipers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural inf- affection, implacable, unmerciful. We see all of that all over our world today. By the way, it's not anything that's new. It's been in our world ever since day one, ever since the fall of creation. And you know what the practical application is from this part right here? God's wrath is deserved. I need salvation. I need salvation. Humanity's in a mess. You know, original sin, I believe the Bible tells us that we are born sinners. We're not born naturally good and righteous. No, we are born dead in our trespasses and sin. Original sin leaves us with a desire for things that God hates, okay? That's how we're born into this world. Well, you know what actual sin does? When you start dabbling with sin and you start doing things that you know you should not do, it begins to harden your heart, and over time your conscience becomes seared. And then actual sin, as it it hardens your heart, you know what happens? It ends up becoming indwelling sin. And you know what indwelling sin does? Indwelling sin traps you. Indwelling sin causes you to believe a lie that because I am caught up in this and because I am stuck in this, I can never change and I can never get out and this is who I am and this is who I am going to forever be. And I need to remind you about the very beginning where Paul started all of this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation. It's a lie. The wrath of God has been revealed so the righteousness of God can be revealed. And all you got to do is put your faith and trust Trust in him and only him and what he did for you on the cross. And he can change you and he can let the righteousness of God become evident in your life. Don't fall for it. My heart has been so burdened and heavy this week. Because Number one, I knew this is a heavy passage. This is heavy. But I also believe that there probably are people, dozens of people here that that may even have indwelling sin in your life and you're falling for the lie of Satan. No, no. There is salvation, and it is available, and it's the power of God, and it can save you, and it can change you, and it can transform you. And that leads me to the last point. God's wrath is avoidable. God's wrath, for you and I, it's it's avoidable. Look at verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. The part that I want you to see about this is one more time. He says, who knowing the judgment of God. Just a quick review of what we've seen in this passage. When they knew God. We talked about the de-evolution of man, right? We come into this world. We know who God is. We knew God. And then it says, we took the truth of God that we know, and we turn it into a lie. And then he ends by saying, who knowing the judgment of God, all of these things are being revealed. And the fact that we have God's word and the fact that we have this truth is being revealed so that we won't stay in our sin, but that we'll run to our Savior. The wrath of God is 100% avoidable in our lives because of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and because of what he did on the cross. And you have a choice. We all have a choice. We can either do what the rest of the verse says, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Listen, when you are confronted with the truth of God's word, and you knowingly reject it and run away from it, at some point your heart is going to become hardened where you rejoice, you defiantly shake your fist in God's face and says, I'll show you, God, I know better. I'll live how I want. I'll do what I want. And you take great pleasure in the wicked things that this world is doing and a part of. That's one option that we have. God God doesn't force us to believe him. He gave us a free will. 
So you can either choose to reject the truth of God and you can live your own way, or, or you can take advantage of the gospel. I need the gospel. You need the gospel. Our world desperately needs the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. Man, a message like this, a passage like this, it ought to convict us. It ought to give us a deep sorrow. It ought to give us a hatred towards sin. As we walk away from this and as we think about the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, man, as we think about sin, as we think about even our own lives, do you feel the conviction of sin? Do you recognize that when we do the things that we know we should not do, that we open ourselves up for the wrath of God and that that pain that's in our lives? It's not meant to hurt us. It's meant to wake us up. Let that conviction prick your heart to the point where you are willing to forsake and confess your sin and you're willing to run away from it. Let it drive you to a deeper hatred and abhorrence of evil and all the destructive things that sin does in our lives and in our walk with God and in our families and in our homes to the point that we desperately get on our knees and we cry out for God, but it leads us to a hunger and a thirst for the righteousness of God. That's where you and I as believers need to be. Yeah, just get rid of that sin. Confess it. He'll remove it as far as the east is from the west. He will forgive because that's who our God is. But then as soon as you get it, confess hunger and thirst and beg God for his righteousness to be revealed in you. Let him change you and transform you because that's what the gospel of Jesus can do. What this world needs are believers who are living testimonies of the power of the gospel. Not believers who get sucked into the same type of backbiting and hatred and maliciousness that's in this world. And by the way, I see a whole, I get discouraged when I get on social media. Some of the things that I see Christians posting are just, it's unbelievable. It's totally against God and the Bible. We shouldn't be attacking one another. We shouldn't be glorying in things that God says are wrong. No, we ought to be living examples. The light of this world, the salt of the earth, people that point people to Jesus. We ought to be sharing hope. We ought to be sharing the good news of the gospel. We ought to be living it out every day. Our lives ought to be filled with love and joy and peace and gentleness and goodness. Man, when the world accuses us of, of hating homosexuality, our actions ought to prove 100% the exact opposite because no, how we acted was in love and mercy and burden and grace as we just serve and minister to people that are lost and in desperate need of Jesus. That's what we need. We need the gospel. If you're lost, you need the gospel for salvation. As a believer, we need the gospel more than ever because we live in a world that is increasingly becoming darker and darker to the truth and yet When it gets darker, the light of Jesus shines brighter, and I believe with every bit of my heart. These are not days to be discouraged. These are not days to go cower and hide in our closets, to come here with a bunker mentality. These are days to advance the gospel. The gates of hell cannot stand against the gospel. Our world is hungry for hope in Jesus. You know, almost every bit of that stuff that I I taught about homosexuality came from a homosexual who put her faith and trust in Jesus Christ and was glorious change. That was her words. Rosario Butterfield is her name. She's an incredible apologist as well for who God is. God can change lives, and he can do a work.